for infinity points. Who is the first woman mentioned in the Bible? Is it A. Sarah, B. Ruth, C. Esther, or D. E. The first woman mentioned in the Bible is Eve. Now for our last question, worth a bunch of points. Which of these is not a book in the New Testament? Is it A, 1 Corinthians, B, 3 John, C, 2 Thessalonians, or D, 3 Peter? Third Peter is not a book in the New Testament. Thanks for playing Bible Trivia. We hope you'll play again soon. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here today. It's another day that we choose to to worship our Lord. Still tumultuous times. Is anybody surprised that everything's not back too easy peasy? Well, you know, God told us that we would have difficult times, and then he reminded us that within those difficult times, he is with us. And that, when you really think about it, is the most important thing. Whatever comes, he's there. Whatever happens, whatever changes, he's there. And so, I find that extremely encouraging, and I hope you do too. And as we sing these songs today, as we worship Him, we're just hoping to give Him the glory and to let Him know that we love Him, and we're glad that He loves us. You are God alone. Stand if you want to, please. Here we go. You were not a God created by human hands. You were not a God dependent on any mortal man. You were not a God in need of anything we can give by your plan. That's just the way it is. You are God alone from before time began. You were on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone. You are unchangeable, you are unshakable, you are unstoppable, that's what you are. You are unchangeable, you are unshakable, you're unstoppable, that's what you are. You're the only God whose power none can contend. You're the only God whose name and praise will never end. You're the only God who's worthy of everything we can give. You are God, that's just the way it is. You are God alone, from before time began. You were on your throne, you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne, you are God alone. You're unchangeable, you're unshakable. You're unstoppable, that's what you are. You're unchangeable, you're unshakable. You're unstoppable, that's what you are. You are God alone from before time began. You are on your throne, you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, 
You are on your throne. You are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. Please be seated. Hi, and welcome to church. Before we get started, we'd like to share a little bit about who we are and what we're all about. At our church, you will find a community of passionate believers connected, connected by, by our, our faith, faith in Christ. Christ. We believe the Bible is true. And we strive to present it in a way that's practical. We want to give you something that you can apply to your life now. Let's face it, we're all a work in progress. We are all on a journey, and we invite you to come along. We believe that life change happens through genuine, genuine relationships. So we work hard to create an environment that is loving and accepting. And we want to let you know that this is a church where you can belong before you believe. But above all, we want you to know that no matter where you've been, no matter where you are, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And there's a place for you here. So get ready. Your experience starts now. Welcome church family, friends and visitors. We need your help every week. Please complete and submit or connect form. If you're new here, we'd love to get to know you. If you're with us online, we need to know you are there and doing okay. In either case, if you have a question or a prayer request, the Connect form are the best way to let us know. If you know we already have all your contact info, putting just your names is enough. Thanks for helping us to help you. Now let us rejoice in worshiping our Lord together. Please stand if you can, sit if you need to. You can stand out there on, in uh, camera land. Two songs we're going to sing. The first one. Again, reminding ourselves that God is with us. The second song is going to be, You Never Let Go. God doesn't let go. Nothing breaks His grip from us. And the first song is, going to, is, an, is the hymn, Just When I Need Him Most. And the whole point of that is, in difficult times, just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, Jesus is here, just when I need Him most. Here we go. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him, Jesus is true, never forsaking all the way through, giving for burdens, pleasures anew. Just when I need Him most Just when I need Him most Just when I need Him most Jesus is near to comfort and cheer Just when I need Him most Just when I need Him, Jesus is strong Bearing my burdens all the day long For all my sorrow, giving a song Just when I need Him most Just when I need Him most Just when I need Him most 
Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him, He is my all. And when upon Him I call, tenderly watching lest I should fall, just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him most. Just when I need Him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need Him most. Here we go. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death your perfect love is casting out fear and even when i'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life i won't turn back i know you are near and i will fear no For my God is with me, and if my God is with me, who then shall I fear? Who then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low oh, oh no you never let go lord you never let go of me and i can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare and there will be a lens live to know you're here on the earth and i will fear no evil for my god is with me and if my god is with me whom then shall i fear whom then shall i fear Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. You keep on running and you never let go. Singing, oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm oh no you never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go lord you never let go of me yes i can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes still i will praise you still i will praise you oh no you never let go through the calm and through the storm oh no you never let go in every high and every low Lord, you never let go of me. You may be seated.
We always take time as part of our service to, to pray. Uh, we think it's important that we share one another burdens and cares and concerns. So this is an opportunity for us to pray about needs that we know and things that uh, we're aware of. Uh, I want to thank you very much for praying for my dad. Uh, the blood test showed nothing and the physical examination showed nothing. They just told him to get up slower. So don't be in a rush to get up, Dad. So thank you, Lord, that there wasn't anything to be found. So I'm grateful for that and thank you for those who prayed. I also want to make an announcement. Uh, Franca, Franca and I are now grandparents in waiting. So if I need to translate that, our middle daughter, uh, who lives in San Jose, is pregnant. She just finished her first trimester. So this will be my first grandchild. So like those of you that have child, grandchildren, you probably can relate it's a great feeling, and I'm grateful. So we just pray for Gabriella and Caleb over the course of the next uh, six months. So, All right, let's take this time. If you feel led to pray here, please do so. I'll start. Pastor Mike will finish. And if you'd like to type a prayer online, please do that as well so that we can uh, use this time of prayer to come before God and to honor Him, to praise Him, and to ask Him for our needs. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day. I'm thankful, Father, that... Uh, blessed my family with a, a grandbaby on the way. Just thank you, Father. And just pray for my daughter, Gabriella, and her husband, Caleb, as they go through the changes that come with having a baby. Father, I, I feel equally blessed, doubly blessed, when uh, uh, the fact that the, the baby is due on my birthday in February. So uh, just gives it an ex extra spe special feeling for me. So thank you, Father, for that. Thank you, Father, that you love us. And even in the midst of the turmoil and trouble, even... We look around and all we read is bad news. Father, you're there with us and you don't let go of us. Thank you, Father, for that. Thank you, Father. There is other news besides all the bad news. <laughs> Thank you, Father, that you love us. Thank you that we can lift our needs to you. Father, I just pray for uh, Brian, who's home now. I just pray for Sharon as she'll be taking care of him. I pray for Sharon and her family as her daughter is getting married today. I pray that she'll be with, uh, in that circumstance and ceremony. I thank you, Father, for uh, those things that uh, I know about and that I pray for. Thank you, Father, you know our needs before we ask, and I'm grateful for that. I just uh, am grateful and thankful, and I just pray that you would continue to bless our church, guide us going forward, give us wisdom. Thank you, Father, that Placer County is uh, not on the governor's watch list anymore. So I pray, Father, you continue to grant mercy on us that the virus might be uh, something in the past. Father, that's what I'd hope for. That's what I pray for. Give wisdom to those that are in leadership that make decisions that impact us. And Father, I just pray that you'd be in the midst of these circumstances. You're with us and help us to be buoyed by that. Help us to be strengthened by that. Help us, Father. I pray for the rest of this service. I thank you for an opportunity to sing praise. And now I pray, Father, that you give us all an opportunity to hear your word. So I pray for Pastor Mike as he shares your word today. Guide us and watch over us. Thank you, Father. Father, today we give you praise because you are worthy of praise. And as we give you praise, Lord, we come into your presence asking for your forgiveness of our sins. Lord, we know that we are sinners. We are broken people. And we come before you asking for your generous hand to mend us, to make us right in your sight. Lord, today we pray especially for our country, our country is indeed a broken country. There is much hatred. There is much violence. Lord, we need your hand. We need your presence to change this country. Lord, we are founded as a country on the principles of your word, on your Bible. Father, that was at one time the only textbook in a school was the Bible, and now it's banned from those very schools. Father, we pray that you would change the hearts of the men and women in this country, that we may once again be a strong Christian nation united by Christ. 
Lord, we pray for those who are suffering injury in these terrible fires and pandemic. We pray for those who are struggling to find a reason for all of this. And I am confident, Lord, that today that the reason that these are happening is to bring us closer to you, to stop depending on our own ways, but depend on the Spirit of God for our strength and our power in this world. Lord, we do lift up those in our body who are hurting and struggling, those who are sick. Lord, I call the names of those that you already know. And I ask you for your healing, Lord. I ask you for your strength and the strength in their families, Lord, to be able to stand strong in these troubled times. Father, you are the God of all creation. Nothing escapes your attention. Not the least, not the greatest. Everything is in your sight. So today, Lord, we beg for your revival in this country. We pray for your people to come closer to you. Lord, we we think that just attending a service on a Saturday or Sunday or sometime during the week is what it's all about. But Lord, you know it's not. It's about a real relationship with you. So we pray that these relationships, Lord, will be rekindled. That men and women, and even the young, the children, Lord, will remember and know what it's like to stand before the living God. We praise you today because you are worthy of praise. And we give you our thanks. In Christ's name, amen. Well, this morning as we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, can I ask our deacons to come forward and to assist this morning? As we get a little closer to one another, I'll put a mask on. This morning, for those of you who are here, there are combined packets, and in the packet you'll find the juice, and in the top of the packet you'll find the wafer for the Lord's Supper. For those of you who are at home, we ask that you join us and use whatever it is that you have that can stand in for the bread and for the juice. And... Join us in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is sharing the Last Supper with the disciples. He has called out Judas, a terrible, terrible indictment. And then while they're eating, he begins the process of sharing what is going to happen to him by sharing the Lord's Supper. So let us pass these out. Thank you, Father, for your sacrifice and your Son. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, gentlemen.
So while we were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he said, after he had blessed it, take and eat. This is my body. Father, thank you and praise you for this broken body of Christ that gave our penalty. In Christ's name, amen. Then he took the cup. He gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. Thank you, Father, for the broken body and the shed blood by which we are redeemed. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> well, this morning as we begin, um, I want to encourage you to do a couple of things. I want you to, uh, those of you who are here and uh, those of you who are at home, <clears throat> to uh, do your best to connect with the members of the body. Uh, it's important. Uh, there are many who are feeling lonely. There are many who are feeling uh, disconnected. And they need us to spend some time in conversation and letting them know that they are not forgotten, that they are in fact loved, and uh, that we encourage them. This morning, as we continue in uh, our series of revival, I want to uh, encourage you also to um, to think and to uh, consider ways that you might come alongside and encourage those who have lost everything in these terrible fires, or perhaps even those who are struggling through this pandemic. There's a lot of fear out there, and uh, I want you to know that this church uh, is a safe place that we encourage you, that we want to lift you up, that we want you to know that uh, because our, our whole motto, our whole purpose is to show his love and tell his story, that we will do whatever we can to help you through these times. Uh, and I want to tell you, do not be afraid. Uh, fear is the devil's uh, weapon. If he can make you afraid, if he can make you hesitant, uh, then uh, he takes away the strength that you have and the power of Christ. So do not be afraid. And I know it's easy to say, but you know, if you look in the Old Testament, as God talks to uh, uh, many of his people, he says over and over and over and over again, be courageous, be very courageous. Be courageous, be very courageous. To be courageous is to have heart. And so I want to encourage you this morning to have heart because God is still in charge. He's still in his heaven. He's still in his kingdom. He still is in his people. And he will bring us through this terrible time uh, if we depend on him. You know, uh, sometimes we need to uh, remember that. Uh, we forget sometimes that God's in charge. But God is truly in charge. Now, as we continue uh, our series on a deep need for spiritual revival this morning, uh, we need to understand that real revival has its genesis, has its root in the profound grief of God's people. When God's people come to a place where they are grieving over their sin, when they are deeply sorry for their sin, then they turn to him, and they ask his forgiveness, 
And in that forgiveness, God also gives them strength to carry on in the task that he's laid before them. And make no mistake, God has laid a task upon the church today. He wants us to be the church in a lost and dying world. So we remember today that uh, there's this broken people, which includes me and includes you. And we are not only broken, uh, we are broken in heart. And something needs to happen about that. Uh, when we remember that, that we're broken, God, God can make it right. You know, but God, you know, it's like this. It's, um, if any of you have, uh, ever tried to hold a, a baby or a child who is angry and kicking and squirming and fighting and arching his back or her back, and struggling against you, it's really hard to hold that kid. It's really hard to hold that kid. You know, they'll kick you, and sometimes they'll bite you, and they'll do everything. And that's the way we are sometimes with God, isn't it? We just get that way with God. You know, we kick and fight and scratch against God. And yet, what God's purpose is, is to love us and hold us. But you know, just like you as a parent, if you try to hold a dirty kid who's just run through the mud puddle, and is filthy, and you pick him up, you know that that kid wants to hold you. And he will snuggle up into you. And that's the way it is with us. When we realize that we're, we're dirty in our sin, and we snuggle up into God, God will hold us. And he'll hold us close. And he'll love on us. Because God doesn't care if we're dirty, because he can clean us. Just like a parent gives a baby a bath, God will clean us. But if we fight against God, it's really hard for God to hold on to us. Well, today as we look at our uh, our scripture today, we're going to look at King David. And you'll remember the story of David and Bathsheba found in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And you'll remember that David was supposed to be out with the other kings in battle, and uh, but he wasn't. He was, uh, he was where he wasn't supposed to be. He was home probably being a little lazy. He says, well, I, you know, I've been out to battle, and I know what it's like, and I'd rather be home than be in battle today. And so he's up on his roof, and he sees Bathsheba. And of course, you know the story. He looks on her. She's naked in her bath, and he calls for her, and they end up uh, sleeping together. And because they do, she becomes preg pregnant. <clears throat> and it's not a happy occasion like Pastor Paul today. It's not a good thing, because now the king has committed adultery, and he has uh, committed adultery with one of his general's wives. And like many of us, he does what we try to do sometimes. When he's in danger of being found out, we find out that David uh, compounds his sin error. Now, of course, I know all of you out there, and, uh, and I have never tried to compound our sin error, have we? Yeah, that's not true, is it? Uh, when we're in danger of being found out, we try to fix it ourselves, and that's what David did. And he called for Uriah the Hittite, you know the story, and uh, Uriah wouldn't sleep with his wife, so he had to resort to uh, engineering Uriah's murder, and he sets him in the front of the battle, and he withdraws from him, or he calls the, uh, has the troops withdraw from him, and Uriah the Hittite is then killed in battle. Uh, essentially, it's murder, because that's what David planned. But you know that uh, God doesn't let that lie. God doesn't let sins like that lie. Uh, we see here that uh, uh, there is a man named Nathan the prophet. And uh, he knows what's happened. He's discovered the sin. Scripture tells us that we can't hide our sin, that it's going to be discovered. It's better to confront our sin and to go and to deal with it. But we find that Nathan finds out that uh, the king has sinned, and he goes to the king and he tells him a little story. And of course, David being uh, the king gets all lit up in uh, righteous indignation. 
And he wants to find out who this terrible person is that Nathan is talking about. And uh, he's going he's gonna to fix it. And Nathan looks him in the face and he says, you're the man. Now, you know, Nathan had to dig deep to confront the king because, of course, the king has the power over his life. But he digs deep and he confronts the king and he says, you're the man. It's hard to face somebody uh, who has power over you, isn't it? It's hard to face somebody and indict them for their wrongdoing when they have power over you. Or even, uh, you know, a family member or a friend, uh, and you risk losing the friendship or breaking the fellowship with a family member, but you confront them in their sin. And that's what Nathan did. It takes a lot to stand up to somebody like that. Well, here's the thing. Jesus tells us, first of all, that we need to be sure that we're on firm ground. In uh, Matthew 7, he says, Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but did not notice that log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll clearly see to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And, you know, that's the first step. If you're going to confront somebody about their sin, you need to make sure that you're on firm ground. And that brings us to the, the person that's hardest to confront. And that person is ourself. It's hard to confront yourself. It's hard to look in the mirror of your life and say, friend, you're guilty. You're guilty of sin. You know, we like, to, we like to give levels of sin, don't we? This is a little white lie, that's a black lie, this is okay because it's for this reason we justify or, or we rationalize our sins. But here's the thing, in God's eyes, a sin is still a sin. Scripture tells us we all sin and fall short. Now how much do you have to be short to fall short? You know, I went on a fishing trip one time. And uh, the man that I was with uh, brought the boat into the dock after I had parked the truck and trailer. And he brought the boat into the dock. And just as I reached out and put my hands on the foredeck, uh, he cut the engines. And he was looking at me, and he kept just bumping the engines enough. But the boat just kind of kept slipping away until I was stretched out between the deck of the boat with my toes on the dock. Now, I'll, I'll bet you can figure out what happened. I was just short enough that I took a bath that morning, and I spent a good portion of the time very cold. Listen, friends, we don't have to be short by much to be short. And sin is falling short. And that's where we are. Now, we see that, that Nathan confronted David, but, you know, David, it tells us, had lived about a year before Nathan confronted him. So I'm thinking that David was probably okay. He, pro he probably figured everything was all right. But then Nathan comfort, uh, confronted him. And in 2 Samuel 12, 13, it says, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has taken away your sin." You shall not die. Now I can just I can just see David's face. He's confronted by Nathan. He's found out. The sin is known. And Nathan is talking to him, and you just see the beads of sweat forming on his head. And then Nathan says, You shall not die. And you can just see David go, Shh. Dodge that bullet. And that kind of brings us to today's scripture. David realized there was something deeper he had to deal with. And he comes before God in Psalm 51, the first five verses. He realizes that he has sinned against God, and he says to God, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions, 
Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned. Have I done evil what is in your sight? So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in, my, and in sin my mother conceived me. I want you to notice that, that, first of all, David really acknowledges his sin. I've sinned. You know, that's the first step to reconciliation, admitting you're wrong. In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis writes this. He says, for a long time I used to think this is a silly, straw-splitting distinction. How could you hate what a man did and not hate the man? But years later it occurred to me that there was one man to whom I had been doing this all my life, namely myself. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things that I loved was that I loved the man just because I loved myself. I was sorry to find that I was the sort of man who did these things. Consequently, Christianity does not want us to reduce by one atom the hatred we feel for cruelty and treachery. But it does want us to hate them in the same way in which we hate things in ourselves. Being sorry that the man should have done such things and hoping, if in any way is possible, that somehow, sometime, somewhere, he can be cured and made human again. Like David, C.S. Lewis had looked into the mirror of his own life and realized that he was fooling himself. He hated the things he had done, but he had not dealt with the inner man. Folks, we can hate the things we do. We can hate the fact that we sin. We can hate our addictions. We can hate all those ways that we know we fall short. But we've got to deal with the inner man. There is no revival until we deal with the heart issue of the inner man. David looked in that mirror, and seeing his sin, he realized that in God's eyes he was severely broken, and begged God, in the light of his grace, in the light of his loving kindness, and in the light of his compassion, for forgiveness. You and I are likewise broken by our sin. But it's not just enough to be broken by our sin. We need to be broken-hearted as well. We are in desperate need of the gracious, compassion, compassionate, loving kindness of God's forgiveness and healing. We need it. We need it desperately. And sometimes we just don't realize the depth of our depravity. You know, I, I've learned something in my young life. I've learned that if we ask God to reveal our need, our shortcomings, our sinfulness, God will do it. But I think that we're afraid that if we do that, God will indeed reveal it, and we'll have to deal with it as David did. But there's no revival in, in us until a revival takes place in our human heart. It's in that healing compassion that God blots out our transgressions and washes us clean. We become new creatures. Essentially, he revives us. We get the godly defibrillator. You know, like we're in the hospital and we've had a heart attack and they put the paddles to our heart and zap and your heart is restarted. That's what God does to a believer who comes in, him, in his presence with real, honest confession and repentance. God restarts his heart. We can get those paddles applied one way or another. We get them to restart our heart, or we get them on the seat of learning. But either way, God will apply the defibrillator to you and I, you and me, so that we can serve Him in a way that honors and glorifies Him. Because you see, one of the things that David did was he he ruined God's reputation. Listen. 2 Samuel 12, 14. However, because by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, to take the name of God lightly, to disparage the name of God. Because of David's behavior, because of his sinful behavior, 
God's name was diminished among the people. Now listen, how many times have you heard people say, I'd become a Christian if it weren't for Christians? And we kind of, we kind of slough that off and say, well, I'm not that person. Or well, maybe you are and maybe you're not. I don't know. But it bears examination. We need to look into our own hearts and see if indeed we are that person. You know, do we live hypocritical lives? Do we live lives that cause people to blaspheme the name of the Lord? But listen, it goes further. The child also that is born to you shall surely die. You see, David's consequences were that he was forgiven of his sin, but he had to live with the consequences. And the first consequence was that he was going to be, uh, uh, he was going to lose that child that was conceived illegitimately. And that's a sad thing. Now we know because of scripture that the child is safe. The child doesn't pay the price for the, for the father's or mother's sin. But he died. Now if you've ever experienced the death of a personal child, a young child, you know the pain that that causes. David had to deal with that, and you'll remember the story. He grieved until the child had gone to be with God. And then he realized that he would see that child again. But the pain was there, and the, and the problem was there with his leadership. You know, recently there's been a lot of press about uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. and his wife and the affairs that both of them have had. And at first it was thought it was just the wife, but then it was discovered that uh, the husband, uh, Jerry Falwell Jr., had participated in that affair. And uh, now he is held up. A public disgrace because of sin. His sin became, and their sin became very public and very costly. And like others before them, the consequences of their sin, like David's, are very, very costly in the kingdom of God. Because now people look and say, if that's how Christians behave, why would I want to be a Christian? Why would I want to be a Christian? And David faced himself, and he acknowledged his sin. He acknowledged it before God, and that's the first step in the remedy. The request for forgiveness and the acceptance of the consequences. There are stories that have been told who people about people who have come to know the Lord who have been thieves and have made restitution or have gone to prison and, uh, and have not regretted uh, the prison sentence because they knew that there was a consequence attached to their sin. And like you, uh, there's a consequence attached to your sin. You may say, well, I, you know, I'm, I've gotten away with this. No, you haven't. Because there are many ways that consequences will be paid. You know, there's the constant guilt for many. There's the, the, uh, a child who is born out of wedlock. There are the troubles that come that are attached to that. So we don't get away with anything in God's economy. Take a look at this. Verse 4, against you, David says, against you, and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. No sin is hidden. But all sin, all sin, no matter uh, what kind of sin, we think is just against one another or just against another person. All sin is against God. We talk about victimless crimes uh, when we talk about prostitution or we talk about uh, addiction. But those sins are, may not be against a particular person, but they are sins against God. And God will not tolerate that. So David continues to, con to realize and to express the depth of his own loss, his own depravity, his own sin. He says in verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Now, it, it, his mother was not sinful in his conception. That's not the point. The point is, is that he was born with a propensity like you and me. He was born with a propensity to sin. Given a choice, we choose what makes us comfortable, we choose what makes us feel better, we choose what we think we can get away with, because we're human beings. We are born with a propensity to sin, and given the choice, we'll choose what we think benefits us 
most. Even though it may cost somebody else. Think of the wars that churches get into over the simple things of carpeting or paint or roof job. We'll talk more about the roof later. But you have to understand that we become very selfish in our desires. I like this. I don't like that. This makes me feel good. That doesn't. And so in that, we choose what we think will benefit us or makes us feel good. However, when we follow the example of Jesus, we give ourselves for the needs and benefits of others. You know, we have to make a choice, and if we follow Christ, if we really think about who Jesus was and what he did, we follow him realizing that he gave himself for others. And if we are believers in Christ, that is our role, to give ourselves for others. Excuse me. In Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul tells us, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. We live for Christ so that others might live in Christ. Does that make sense? We live for Christ that others might live in Christ. Here's the thing. If we truly desire to express revival in, our, in this people of God, it begins with a revival in our own heart. You know, it's easy to look in the mirror and say, you know, I'm not guilty of anything. And I pray, God, that that's true in your life. I wish I could say that, that, that it's true in mine. But I, if I really examine my life, I can find things that need to be fixed. How about you, if you're really honest? You know, David went from being a shepherd boy to a great king, a man after God's own heart, and yet he failed. In these days of quarantine, whether you agree with them or not, there's a danger taking place in the people of God. And the danger is this, that there is a, 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 a danger that a lethargy of spirit is overtaking us. We're in danger of sinking into a pit of loneliness and spiritual doldrums. It's become easy. I have a cartoon that shows a lady showing up at church wearing bunny slippers and her pajamas uh, <laughs> because she forgot she was coming to church. But it's deeper than that. You know, we get used to not meeting and supporting the people of God. I'm told that if things go right in our county, that we may be able to do open the doors by the 18th of next month and people can gather once again uh, to celebrate Christ. I hope that that's true. But in the meantime, we need to fight against the spiritual doldrums and the spiritual lethargy and have a revival in every heart, a revival of the joy of being the people of God, a revival of the presence of God in our country. And this lethargy, spiritual laziness, can cause even the committed believer to drift away. We need to battle against that. I believe with all my heart that uh, we are uh, being attacked by the evil one, that this whole uh, pandemic, that this whole process is a spiritual attack more than anything else. And we see the church uh, attack to the extent that many have closed and some unfortunately, have closed permanently, they could not survive. Thank God that our people have been faithful and we have been able to survive. But those who survive need to revive. Does that make sense? Survivors need to be revivers. Those of us who are still serving and still living for Christ need to reach out to those and encourage them 
to be strong and committed. So in light of these things, well, there are some things we must do. First, uh, to, if we're going to be revivalists and we're going to revive, we need to keep short accounts with God ourselves. Everything in your life, keep a short account. Uh, we're not guaranteed one more minute, let alone one more day. And so I would encourage you to keep short accounts with God. Second, use the time that you have now, this time of quarantine or isolation, use this time to grow closer to God in your prayer life and time in the Word. Spend time in the Word. I know that many of you uh, have, have been putting together puzzles, have been, putting, uh, have been working uh, word puzzles, have been reading uh, all kinds of materials, uh, have been doing whatever. But use this time to get closer to God. Use this time to, to get into the Word, to, to spend some hours that you now have in the Word of God. And the third thing is reach out to one another to encourage one another and pray for one another. And, and you pray intelligently when you share the real gut-level things of your life. You know, I, I'm sorry to say that there are people who, who are afraid to share because they're afraid that what they're, share, they're sharing is going to become viral on the Internet. <laughs> But, you know, intelligent prayer is important. Intelligent prayer helps us to go to battle for those who are in need. Finally, you need to maintain a connection between every member of the body of Christ. Maintain that connection. Make a phone call, write a letter, send a card. Because we need to be strong, because this is a battle, folks. This is a real battle. It's a battle for spiritual supremacy in our own community and on our own culture. And as we dig deep in our spiritual life, we strengthen the bonds of Christ and we experience revival in the face of this assault on the church of the living God. So what are we going to do? Begin by using your time. Get strong in your relationship. And as you get stronger, help others get stronger. Remember Galatians, brethren, even if anyone is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself, so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Today, we're praying for revival. And if we're going to have revival, we need to help one another. We need to help one another be strong. We need to lift one another up. We need to walk with one another, encourage one another, teach one another. I like that Bill Withers song, Lean on Me. Lean on me. Lean on one another. And lean on Jesus Christ. Amen? In your bulletin, we always have that little uh, two-line thing. What is God saying to me today? Not my neighbor, not my husband or wife, not my next door neighbor, my friend, but what is God saying to me? And then what am I going to do about it? So today, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? Is it going to take a Nathan to stand in your face and say, you're guilty? Or are you going to go and look in the mirror and say, Lord, forgive me, for I am broken, and indeed I'm brokenhearted. Heal me and forgive me in Christ's name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you are the God of our salvation. We thank you that no matter what has happened in our lives, we can come into your presence and we can beg your forgiveness and we can repent of our sin and turn away. And Lord, you will lift us up and you will restore us. You'll mend our broken hearts. You'll mend our broken lives. You will lead us in the way of salvation. You will wrap your arms around us and protect us from the evil one. And you will do that if we will just trust you completely with everything in our lives. Thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we're going to sing, Oh, Come to the Altar, as we sing that together. Uh, I encourage you to sing out at home. I encourage you to pray at home. I encourage you to encounter God this morning in your own home or if you're here to do that here. Let's stand and sing this together, that God may be glorified. <clears throat> Are you hurting, bro?
broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin. Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's songs are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your mistress and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You can find healing and forgiveness of a broken life at the altar of Jesus Christ. So come. Uh, if you'll be seated, we've got a couple of announcements I uh, want to let you know about. First of all, uh, there is a, a process uh, to give by mail. If you would like to continue supporting the church, I encourage you to do so. Uh, you can give by mail. You can uh, set it up with your bank to do bill pay, and it'll, it'll happen automatically. Uh, you can do online giving. There are links. If those of you who are online, uh, there's a link uh, right there where you are. Uh, you can use that link to support the work of this church. And we encourage you to do that. We thank you for it. Uh, it's a it's a, a gift of God. You know, uh, in the Old Testament and uh, uh, even in the New Testament, uh, giving was part of worship. It's an important part. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Uh, I want to also to encourage you to fill in your Connect card just to let us know that you're here. Uh, don't always know uh, if you're still in contact with us, and uh, we miss you. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be able to meet again uh, beginning in the 19th. Uh, I pray that that is so. Uh, in the meantime, stay in connection with us. Let us know that you have uh, you have come. Uh, there is something that we need to discuss. Uh, I need to make you aware of it. Uh, we have a, a very aging church roof. And uh, if your roof goes, then pretty soon uh, in the rainy season, you begin to experience leaks and things get even more costly. Uh, we need to raise uh, $20,000 uh, as soon as we possibly can uh, to repair uh, the church roof. Uh, that's going to entail stripping off everything that's up there and replacing it uh, with a new roof. Um, unfortunately, uh, w we don't have all that we need, but fortunately, because of your generosity and because of your faithfulness, we do have $32,000 on hand. Uh, we have other projects that we would like to do. Uh, we're not able to do right now, but this is a, a project that is vitally important to the church. So. Uh, over the next uh, few months, a uh, few weeks and months, uh, hopefully before the rainy season, uh, we need to raise that, raise that $20,000. So uh, whatever you give for the building fund will be applied there, and we want to encourage you to do that. Uh, also, uh, we're in the midst of uh, the season for uh, missions giving, so whatever you give for missions is going to be applied toward the mission, uh, that you uh, identify, 
and we uh, we will put that in the mission fund, and then we will use it as the need arises. Currently, our first gift for missions giving uh, is uh, a gift of a thousand dollars to uh, the California disaster relief effort uh, to help those who are in uh, who have experienced fires. Uh, we need to be able to uh, to come alongside them as a church and. Uh, uh, Jane and I had the opportunity to drive through that area, and it truly is devastated. And so we ask for your assistance there. And yes, I know you're not made out of money, and yes, I know many of you are on um, fixed incomes, and yes, I know the hardship that it will cause. But you have to remember that uh, there was a widow who gave the last cruise of oil and the last bit of meal, and God sustained her uh, through that time. And I am firmly uh, a believer that God will sustain you in your generous hearts. So uh, please uh, do what you can do, what God leads you to do. Uh, the return uh, as a... Um, uh, um, are we ahead of that? The return? Uh, is that the... Okay, uh, the Global Day of Repentance and Prayer. We want to encourage you to do that. It's a call to prayer and repentance and revival nationally. So we ask you to join that, uh, join us in that. It's Saturday, September 26th. There's a podcast uh, with that, and uh, we ask you to be a participant in that. Okay, uh, there's a video, and then we will be dismissed. Since the dawn of time, man has sought a touch from heaven, only to fall away again and again. Yet in every age, men have risen up and called us back with one hope, to see mankind unite in the spirit of prayer and revival and commune with God once again. These great men recognized our fallen state and called us to humility that leads to repentance, confession that brings forgiveness, and prayer with God's mighty hand of favor and protection. In 1857, God used an ordinary clothing salesman named Jeremiah Lampier. In a small room in the heart of New York City, he invited others to simply pray for one hour. At noon on September 23rd, Jeremiah started on his knees alone. By the end of the hour, he had been joined by five more men. That was the beginning of the Layman's Prayer Revival. In a few short months, meetings had sprung up all around, with daily attendance growing to 10,000. Today, our nation is nearly as divided as it was then, just prior to the Civil War. Our one hope is to gather pastors and Christian leaders to stand united to awaken our churches, communities, and our nation once again through the power of prayer. This is our wake up call. Now is the time for repentance, time to turn back to God. Which leads to reconciliation with God and with each other. Bringing about restoration, a healing of our relationships and our land. Then revival. A move of God like we've never seen before. A God led Reformation. Reformation. The Return, September 26, 2020. Go to thereturn.org. As you consider what you just saw, I want to invite you uh, on Wednesday to our uh, prayer time. It's a Zoom meeting. Some of you are having a struggle there, but there are many of you who could attend if you chose. And so I want to invite you and those who are going to the Zoom meeting want to encourage you to invite others to be a part of that prayer meeting. This nation needs prayer. Let's begin that even now. Father, as we come to this place, we thank you that we have the opportunity to serve you, to worship you, to love you, because you are God and there is no other. Father, today we pray that as we worship you today, that others will catch fire and worship you, that we may experience a great revival in our land. We pray for our local leaders, 
our county and state and national leaders, that you will ignite their hearts for repentance and a relationship with the Holy God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you and we'll see you next week.